Welcome. We have a very special interview today with a very special guest. I would like to introduce you to you, the Hugo Award winner, John Joseph Adams. John, how are you doing? Uh, I'm well. Thanks for having me on. It is such a pleasure. We've been having such fun nerding out, chatting, <laughs> all things world building, writing D&D before the call. And guys, there is more of the same coming today. Let me introduce you to John properly because he is was far too modest to introduce himself. John Joseph Adams has been everywhere and done everything, is the TLDR. He's the series editor of Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy and more than 30 anthologies such as Wastelands and The Living Dead. He's also an editor and publisher of the Hugo Award winning magazine Lightspeed. And for five years was the editor of the John Joseph Adams Books novel imprint for Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. And lately, He's joined the dark side. He's been working as an editor on TTRPG products for Cobot Press and Monty Cook and contributing game designer on books such as the Tome of Heroes from our very fine friends over at Cobalt Press. So what's winning right now? Game design, uh, game writing or, or traditional writing? Where, where do your loyalties lie right now on, on the sliding scale of love? Yeah, I mean, the love part is way more towards TTRPGs uh, just because like that's what I probably rather do all the time <laughs> but uh the, but the the practical side is like well i gotta i gotta make a living so i still gotta do this traditional public i mean i still love it all you know but uh it's just that uh you know that's where my heart is leaning these days is toward who's up last with dice guys you heard yes. it here first now john you have mm. done just about every single part of the traditional mm. publishing space haven't you yeah pretty much yeah i mean uh yeah, I mean, I've been doing it since uh, 2001, and so, you know, it's been a long time. Hard to, hard to believe. I'm so old now. <laughs> nonsense. Nonsense. <laughs> Don't say things all like that. You'll upset us all. I know a lot of our authors are interested in, in indie publishing, but a lot are interested mm -hmm. or are curious about mm -hmm. traditional publishing. So my first question is, if our authors were interested in publishing short stories, mm -hmm. for example, in collections like the mm -hmm. ones that, that you turn out, like the Amazing mm -hmm. Lost Worlds collection, what should they do? How should they approach that dream? Right. Uh, well, I mean, I think, you know, uh, uh, just first of all, uh, you should only, I, th I think you should pursue writing short stories if you actually like short stories and like write, writing them. Um, like sometimes people think like, oh, well, I should, I, sh I want to write novels, but I should start off with writing short stories just because it's like a smaller project that I can do. And then I can, you know, maybe get some publications and stuff and that'll make it easier for me to sell a novel later. Some of that's true, but I feel like some people get into this mindset that they just need to do that as a stepping stone, but you don't, you know, like if, if writing novels is what you love, that's what you should pursue. And uh, spending all this time writing short stories is only going to make you frustrated. Um, now, I think short stories are amazing. I love short stories. I mean, I've basically devoted my life to short stories. So um, I would definitely encourage people to uh, read as many as they can to learn to love them if you don't already, because I mean, there's so many great, writers that are writing short stories like today especially like there we're in such a golden age of short fiction uh including just short fiction that you can read online for free um so there's like zero investment uh, required to to experience all this stuff um so um so yeah i mean i but i mean i think so read as many short stories as you can and like i said you know there's lots and lots that you can read online for free um i mean i would uh pick up uh best of the year collections like you know best american science fiction and fantasy or there's a bunch of different ones there's uh, year's best fantasy and horror there's uh you know all, all these different ones um and um you know read those because then that's uh that's showcasing the best that were published over the course of a year um and it's like so in the case of like as series editor it's like you know i read like thousands of stories every year in an, in an effort to winnow it down to the the top 80 who i then i give it to the series the guest editor and then they pick the best 20 stories but uh so i read thousands of stories so you don't have to you only have to read you only you know they're like oh i've done all the work to find here here are these wonderful 20 stories <laughs> for you to read um but uh, reading those uh, kinds of things or, and just reading widely in short stories will help inform you to how, to, how you would go about it. But then as far as actually uh, getting published, a lot of magazines have uh, open reading periods. Uh, some of them are just open all the time. Um, so you just look at their websites, look at, um, look at their submission guidelines and see what, what their guidelines say. Um, there's a lot of different um, market listings. There's like, um, 
there's one called the submission grinder. Uh, there's one called uh, Duotrope. Um, and then there's one that's like, it looks like it's uh, a very old website and, and it is, but it actually is uh, like currently maintained uh, called uh, Rallan.com, uh, R-A-L-A-N.com. Um, and it's very like uh, speculative fiction focused. And so, but like, he, he just updates it all the time. And like, it, it, it's like the, the website is, is, is looking pretty old, but the content is current. Um, and that, and you know, so you can look there and see like, oh, well, there's an anthology that's open or here's this magazine that just reopened after being closed for a while. Um, and uh, so, so there's that kind of thing. Um, and then, uh, and so that's what I would advise. Uh, if like, if you wanna actually write for an anthology, uh, like say like you hear that like you know me or like Ellen Datlow or some in, some editor like you know that they're 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 they announced some anthology that they have coming out, um, and it's like oh I really want to write a, a story for for that book. Well, you're probably not going to be able to write it for that book, but if you want to write for them someday, like in the case of like for somebody like me who has a magazine, you know you could well you know try to sell me a story for the magazine, and if I then like you I like your your stuff, um, then maybe I would invite you to write something for an anthology because anthologies are typically invitation only, mm -hmm. uh, just because. You know, I mean, there's a lot of reasons for it. Sorry, this has become a very big answer. It's fantastic. Um, <laughs> this is exactly the kind of specificity that I wanted from okay. someone who knows the business. Okay. Uh, so uh, one of the one of the reasons uh, that you do invitation only print anthology is because, well, a uh, it makes it a huge project if you do open submissions because you could get a thousand submissions for a one book that's going to publish thirty stories. So it's like that's you know that's a lot. Um, but then also. Um, if you do an open reading period and you have a thousand submissions, you're only going to take, you're probably going to solicit a good number of them. So uh, the number of submissions that you can actually buy from the thousand is probably very small, probably like only five or, or so. Um, and then, um, so then you have to reject, you know, 995 stories. And guess what happens to those? They flood the market. So like say you do a very specific theme and you do this open submission period, you reject all those stories. You know, most of those stories won't sell, but a fair number of them will. They'll sell to all the different magazines that are in the in this space. And then the magazines will probably publish the stories before your anthology comes out. Because, you know, when you do an anthology, it's like the traditional publishing um, schedules are much longer than like just a magazine schedule because magazines are usually more um, very small business sort of like one person runs it kind of deal. Um, and uh, so yeah, so it's like, you know, you do this cool theme and you have this very specific idea and then it's like you reject all these stories and then like, oh, well, by the time your anthology comes out, everybody's gotten Everyone's sick of that. Bored of that already. theme. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. That's so interesting. And as secondhand summary, I said, that's something that I hadn't thought of. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a small caveat of the business that is so interesting that, that, you know, I had no idea about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So interesting. So just to just to recap that, because I, mm -hmm. I think it's very useful when we're talking, mm -hmm. you know, specific career sure. advice to do yeah, recaps. Yeah. If people are interested in short stories, first of all, they should write and read a lot of short stories. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They should submit first to magazines mm -hmm. um, that they like. And they should also consider things like Submission Grinder, Raylan.com, Duotrope as places mm -hmm. to go and look for things, submissions that are open. Yeah. Um, and then hopefully they get solicited by a mm. John Joseph Adams or similar mm -hmm. to yeah. come and write short stories for an anthology. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, and if you do find an anthology that has open submissions, I mean, it's like there's no there's no reason not to try to submit to one of those. But uh, I, I guess I would also say um, consider pay rate. Uh, like, you know, uh, there are a bunch of magazines and, and like sort of anthologies that might have an open call that that, you know, uh, are doing like one cent a word or something for for the for the payment and it's like and that's fine if you want to uh, sell a story to such a place but uh you should consider like okay well i want to start at the top and then like work my way down rather than going like think like don't devalue yourself and think like oh well i'm just beginning i should sell my stuff to a a, a place that's you know paying a, a small amount um you know, it's like uh, if it's a very specific theme, like, and you want to go for it, it's like, okay, we'll go for it, whatever. Like, you know, that if, if you're confident you're going to write more stories and publish more stories, then fine. But it's like, um, you know, I see I see a lot of writers who make that mistake where they um, they don't shoot for the stars, and it's like, well, maybe they could have sold that story to this like really top market, um, but they sold it to a little tiny one instead. So so you know, don't devalue yourself. 
Um, I guess the, just one other thing. Um, so anybody who's like really interested and serious about this and they really want to like grow as a writer, uh, there are a lot of different writing workshops that you can uh, join. And like, so uh, speculative fiction is like sort of rich with these. And so like uh, the most notable one is the Clarion Writers Workshop. Um, and it's like this six week intensive boot camp sort of situation where like, you know, you go to the you go to the venue and like you stay there with like the 18 and other students. And then they have uh, six different instructors uh, over the course of the, the workshop and they're all like professional writers. So like George R. R. Martin has been a teacher there, you know, like everybody, <laughs> everybody's been a teacher there basically. Uh, and it's like, you know, it's rare that you have somebody like George uh, at there, but like they're always very notable writers who are like experts at their craft and they uh and they always only pick people who can actually teach you know like because not everybody knows how to or is good at it um so uh so those workshops are sort of legendary for um you know really like leveling up writers um like as an editor i've seen like people have these like quantum leaps going from like seeing their submissions before they go into clarion and then like seeing them after and like whoa like they they really like internalized those lessons and like really put them to use. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's very, it's, I mean, it's, it's not cheap, you know, they are expensive workshops to attend, but I mean, they are really good if you can, um, if you can make it work for you and, and not everybody's going to need it or want it, but, but it, they are a thing. So there's Clarion, there's Clarion West, and then there's Odyssey. Those are sort of the, the, the big three. Um, although I actually, I also wrote an article about this at some point years ago. Uh, I was updating it every year for a while and I stopped, but uh, the information's all still generally good where like, you know, you just need to look at the websites to see what their current stuff is. But uh, if you Google John Joseph Adams and writing workshop, you'll find it. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I've already seen a request for a blog post from World Anvil listing hmm. some of the short story magazines. Oh, yeah. So John, expect an yeah. email from me. Sure, uh, sure, sure. <laughs> there well, will tell, be a uh, follow up to this. There yeah, will yeah, be yeah. a test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll say what one one quick way for that is like if you pick up something like Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy, in the back there's uh, there's the notable stories, which are the 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 rest of the top eighty that didn't make it into the book. So, um, uh, and if you look at that list, it tells you where each story was published, and so it's like, okay, well, that's basically the top magazines, you know, like because it's like, okay, well, they published the best stuff that year, um, and I mean, but yeah, I can I can definitely um, we can we can get something together for you, so. Yeah, absolutely. This is this is so helpful. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked short stories. Mm -hmm. What about novels? Right. Any advice for writers preparing novels for traditional publication or wanting right. to go that direction? Right. Uh, well, yeah. Um, so when you write a novel and you want to get it traditionally published, I mean, I think everybody should look for an agent first. So like you need to write the novel first and then you have to have it ready and then you have to write a query letter and you're gonna wanna like research that and like what all the different parameters for what it should go in a query letter, query letter should be and how to- Gonna remind the beans, we have done a stream on query letters oh, earlier okay. this year. So do go sure. and check that out. It should yeah, be yeah, on yeah. YouTube now. Right. Um, and so uh, so if you want to get an agent because because of the way traditional publishing works, it's just not really particularly viable to be able to sell novels without one. Um, I mean, there are examples where people have done that. And even as when I was editing my novel imprint, I did buy a couple um, novels from people who didn't have agents. But they were already people who were like in the industry who like I like, you know, in one case, Ashok Banker, like I had published some short stories of his. And then so I ended up or sorry, there uh, he uses they them pronouns now or they use. Uh, so they uh, it's confusing when you know a person before they use different pronouns, you know, uh, but I try, you know, it's, uh, um, but uh, they, uh, you know, I published uh, short stories by them and then ended up acquiring the novels. Um, and uh, and actually, yeah, it happened a couple times, really. But uh, but it's it's a it's a very rare case um, where that works. Um, and and if you don't know people already in the genre space, like it's not probably not going to work for you because not not a lot of publishers even will consider them. And so it would only be a case where um, like if you were if you were working in the field in some other capacity and thus you knew people, like you might be able to get somebody to look at a thing. And again, it would still be a pretty you know, pretty rare case where that would actually pan out. So agent is really the way you would want to go, um, which is, you know, not to say that like, if, you know, if, if, if indie publishing is, is something that you want to do, like there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's very viable these days. Um, but if you do want to go the traditional publishing route, like 
yeah, probably an agent is what you want. Um, and then as far as how to find the right agent for you, uh, you're going to want to do a lot of research that, you know, uh, look in the books of people that you like uh, or, um, or or who have books that are like what the book that you wrote is. Um, and then like look in the acknowledgments and see, did the author thank their agent? That's the easy way to find out who is their agent. Um, because some, you know, sometimes it's just on their website, often it's not. So, but the acknowledgement page is a good place to look. And so you can just see like, oh, okay, well, this agent likes this kind of stuff. So maybe they would like my stuff. Of course, the downside is, well, they already have this author that does this kind of stuff. Maybe they have, maybe they got that covered already, but um, it's, a, it's a starting place. Um, but it also is like a way for you to sort of uh, uh, vet an agent by seeing like, who do they rep? You know, and agents are pretty good about listing who they rep on their websites. But in terms of like, what is it going to mean? What uh, what uh, person um, uh, adds value to you? Because you're like, oh, I really like this author's work. I trust them that they picked a good agent or whatever. You know, so uh, which you know, not every not every author is a great business person, so it might not that might not be the best method. But it's it's just a starting place. You know. Um, and uh, there are a lot of great agents out there. There are a lot of agents out there that not so great. Um, so I mean, I definitely it definitely does pay to do your research. And um, a good agent, honestly, will always pay for themselves. Like, you know, they're going to take 15% off of, you know, domestic stuff. And then like, it's a like a higher percentage on on, on international stuff, just because there's more, you know, people taking piece of the pie. Um, but um, but but a good agent, like, you know, they charge you 15%, but they're going to get you more than 15% than what you would have gotten offered if you had somehow gotten an offer without an agent. <laughs> but the, the the fact is that they're going to know the marketplace. They're going to know who which editor to send your book to at which house, because you can only send it to, like, if you're going to try to publish a novel at Tor, they have, like, 30 editors working there or something. And so it's like, you only get to send it to Tor once, though. So you have to know the right person to send it to that's going to give you the best chance. And a good agent knows that. Um, so, so yeah, so, so that's what I, that's what I would say. And then, um, I mean, the same, same advice as for writing short stories goes, you know, like read widely in the field that you want to publish in. Um, I, I guess I would also say read widely outside the field too, if you can, um, you know, read nonfiction about things that are, are relevant to what happens in your book, you know, so that you can be knowledgeable about it and, and it comes across as authentic. Um, and, um, and yeah, I mean, I think, uh, don't, don't be afraid to, to go outside your sort of comfort zone in terms of what you're reading, because you might pick up different, uh, different things, different tricks, different, um, uh, sort of styles from, from other books, um, that, that are, that are not the sort of typical thing that you would read. Uh, so, and, you know, you might, you might find, you might find it like a unique take by doing that. Um, I mean, there's any number of people who have sort of, uh, fused two different genres or two different elements of genres together to make a, a new unique thing and then have gone on to great success. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's, uh, it's a tried and true, uh, method. So one more time, that is write yeah. a novel that you are happy with. <laughs> Try and find an agent. To mm -hmm. do that, you can search online. You can look in books of authors that are comps, right? Comparable mm -hmm. books yeah. to mm -hmm. try and find who their agents are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, what do you think of tools like Query Tracker? Are you are you sort of aware of these? Are these in your, in yeah. your space? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm aware of things like that. Uh, I don't know enough about them to like sort of evaluate them on a like case by case basis because I haven't I haven't used them myself. Um, but I mean, like, yeah, they they are useful. Like, I I have I mean, I actually have used uh, some of them sometimes because just um, I, I mean, I do actually have an agent myself because uh, when you sell an anthology, it's you're kind of like an author in the in, in the way publishing treats you because it's like so I I would take my anthology proposal out and my agent would sell it, you know, in the same way that he would sell a novel where it's like, you know, he's going to know the right person to send it to at whichever house. Um, and so, um, so I have used them in that case, but, uh, but I mostly relied on like, you know, just my industry knowledge to, to make my decision in that case. But um, so I don't, I know I haven't, I haven't tested those tools extensively, but, but they definitely, I, I do know that they are useful for people because they do have good information. But it's just a starting point. You still have to do research outside of that. And you know, um, if you can, like, like because of social media, uh, 
being so ubiquitous these days, it's like it's a lot easier to sort of like find somebody who is an author of one of the agents that you're looking at and just like look at their Twitter feed or whatever and see if they ever talk about their agent or whatever. And it's like, you know, if they're if they express sort of uh, 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 vague rumbling frustrations about publishing, maybe that's not a great sign. It might, I mean, it might, you know, it's hard to say. You can't always blame your, their agent. Sometimes it's going to be their editor. Sometimes it's going to be something else. But, uh, you know, you might get some sense. Like if they're, if I mean, a lot of people talk about how much they love their agent. And so like, if that's the case, then that's a good sign. But I, so, yeah. I like to think of the agent in the process as kind of like the guide plus translator. Mm -hmm. Like if you, I'm a big Star Trek fan. If you walk into the Klingon court, mm -hmm. you need some, you need a Klingon next to you. You need right. somebody who knows the other Klingons, who speaks right. Klingon, who mm -hmm. can get you a good deal from the Klingon court <laughs> right. and knows what a good deal looks like. And that's mm -hmm. how I like mm -hmm. to think of agents because right. I'm a giant nerd. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I like it. Um, how do you know that your agent is a good fit or that the publisher mm -hmm. is a good fit? Right. Uh, so yeah, an agent, um, I mean, you just, you have to have like a conversation and just like try to talk about like genre broadly and, f and find out like how, like there, it, when you're first signing up with an agent, they're almost like, unless you're already established, they're going to like have read your book and they're going to have thoughts about what you can do to improve it. And when you have that conversation, um, you know, obviously you're gonna have to decide is what they're saying, does what they're saying make sense? Or does it seem like they're off base? Like, does it seem like they didn't really get this book? If you have any sense that they didn't really get your book, they're probably not the right agent for you because even if you revise it, however you revise it, they're maybe not going to really approach it from the right way. Um, like I, I know there was one uh, author I, uh, I know who she had had a meeting with an agent and he said something in the meeting that she just like, uh, responded to so viscerally she was like uh, she was like she 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 made a she, she like grabbed the edge of the table like she was gonna flip the table and and like he actually like he was like are you were you about to flip the table just now um, and I mean she wasn't actually gonna do it but it's like she definitely had the the instinct um, and so it's like okay well that's that's not a great sign um, trust but, your gut uh, yeah 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 um, and the funny thing is it's like that I I know both people in that case and it's like the agent's a great agent. It's just that they weren't a good fit. And and that's fine. You know, like not everybody's a great fit. I mean, like I've rejected stories that have won major awards and stuff. And I've gone back and looked at them again after they won the awards. And I'm like, I still don't like it. I, I don't get it, you know? And it's like, you know, just, well, it wasn't for me, you know? And I mean, I think that's an important lesson to remember <laughs> as well, just in general, um, that just because you get a rejection or something doesn't mean that there's anything particularly wrong with your story. I mean, maybe it does, but, um, you know, it, it's uh, just that that editor was not the right editor for you um, in that case. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, so that's how, uh, sorry, getting back on track here, but um, that, so that's how, you know, you sort of uh, suss out whether an agent's right for you, but then um, uh, an editor, it's, uh, it's kind of similar. Um, you know, you're, uh, you often will have that uh, editorial phone call where, you know, the, that's, that's where you're really going to get the, the real um, sort of feedback on, on what, is, what does this person think that is wrong with your book that needs to be fixed or whatever, or, uh, or, or how do they see it uh, fitting into the marketplace and that kind of thing. Um, and then you'll get a good vibe for, you know, does it seem like they really believe in this book? Does it seem like it's I'm going to get the 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 proper care that uh, uh, the book needs? And and uh, you know, because it's like uh, get it, selling your book to an editor is like a, a very like sort of intimate partnership. Um, you know, and uh, I mean, agent too, really. Like if you if you leave and if you have to break up with an agent, it really is like ending a marriage in a way because it's like you because you also have like shared custody of of properties afterward because okay, an agent. Right. Yeah, because an agent still um, is the agent of record on everything that they sold. So they still get their commission on all those books that maybe are in print and they're still selling. And then so you still have to have a relationship with them because, you know, they or their their company is going to be sending you checks still um, in perpetuity <laughs> until the books go out of print or whatever. Um, so, you, you know, it, it is kind of awkward in that way. But um, so uh, but but for the editors, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, it's 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 much in the same, um, you know, I've had some of these author calls where like I had to, um, 
you know, explain the different ways where I thought like, oh, well, hey, I think, well, this is what this book needs and that and all that kind of thing. But then sometimes it's just like going on and being like a big cheerleader and be like, you know, just really communicate your enthusiasm and excitement and convince them that you're the right editor because you're like, I'm the most passionate about this, you know? And uh, so uh, there's, you know, that's that's another way that you can you know tell if, if an editor is the right one for you to like if you have like multiple people offering on your book which does happen um uh also often it's just like well who's offering me the most money that's the right editor for me you know um but uh you know i i did win at least one bid when we had a multi-book auction that we, like we didn't have the top bid but the author just felt more comfortable going with me because i mean it was close the bid so it, it wasn't like such a big deal but um you know, it, it's not like money, the, the top money always wins out. Sometimes it's like, you got to believe in the editor and, and the publisher and feel like they're really behind you. Um, sometimes like, you know, like I was, uh, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt's, uh, you know, they, they were always, they weren't one of the big five, quote unquote, you know, they weren't so, the, but they were a very large publisher. And so they had, they had basically a lot of the resources of such a big publisher, but, uh, but it was smaller enough that like, um, if you're an author looking at it as considering as a publisher, it's like, okay, well, we we have the resources of a big publisher, but uh, we're not as sprawling as one. So like yeah. when we have a book, we can actually, we can take more care and and, and put you more effort more into this. attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, at least that was the idea. Um, Amazing. So, yeah. Amazing. We have a question here from Shadon, who is clearly a fan. Hmm. Uh, they say, I loved it in Lightspeed when you introduced Women Destroy Science oh. Fiction mm -hmm. and subsequent others who destroy the traditional mm -hmm. ideas of what a genre is. Since mm -hmm. then, have you seen more access to alternative fiction? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, they add, I have indigenous heritage, so that's my main oh. interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, uh, those those uh, special issues definitely like opened up a lot of doors to uh, like, you know, making people feel comfortable submitting to, you know, science fiction magazines or, or science fiction fantasy magazines, feeling like they were welcome in that space. Um, and so like these days, uh, I feel like there's, again, it's like kind of like a golden age in that regard too. Like we're seeing more diverse more diversity and like contributors than we ever have before. Um, and of course, everybody's paying much more attention to it now, realizing that it was this inherent bias problem in publishing for forever. Um, and it's still there in a lot of ways, you know, I mean, and, and I think uh, most people are trying to be, uh, you know, cognizant of it these days. Um, but like, you know, I've still encountered it, um, you know, just sort of uh, a, as an editor talking to people trying to, uh, in publishing, trying to get different projects greenlit and everything. And, and like, it's like, it's like some really uh, baffling sentiments uh, sent my way. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, um, I think I think it's it's indigenous uh, authors are definitely something I, I feel like I, I would love to see more people, uh, you know, writing things uh, and submitting things because it's like there's uh, there's been a big push for uh, black authors and they uh, uh, so like there's a magazine called Faya. Uh, which it exclusively publishes science fiction fantasy by Black authors. And so that's done a lot to uh, really develop um, writers in that space because, uh, you know, well, there's a whole magazine devoted just uh, for for those folks. Um, but uh, yeah, Indigenous people haven't had as much uh, opportunity like that. So um, I would love to see more submissions from, from Indigenous writers. Um, and it is something I do pay attention to. Um, uh, so the uh, the next uh, edition of Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy that's coming out in uh, in November this year is is guest edited by Rebecca Roanhorse. So um, you know uh, I'm I'm hoping that um, you know one side benefit of of having her work on the book might be that more Indigenous people will um, will find it because she herself is Indigenous and and you know maybe they'll uh, be more inspired to to write science fiction fantasy stuff or or else you know uh, feel like they're 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 contributions are welcome you know because i think that's that's just been the, the that was the horrible realization a lot of people in publishing came to you know you know sadly too recently uh is that you know the way the genre was sort of presenting itself and the stories that we were publishing and everything and the way we were going about things was making it so that it wasn't like it didn't feel like a safe space or a welcome space for a lot of different people um <clears throat> and that was a, a large part of what we were trying to you know, destroy with the destroy project, um, that, that sentiment. That. Um, but, uh, yeah. 
I think I think that's so. awesome. Uh, we have another question on a similar bent. Uh, would being a non-native English speaker who writes in English be a disadvantage mm -hmm. in traditional publishing? Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think so. If, uh, I mean, if, if you're writing in English and the English is, uh, you know, if it's done well, then I, I mean, I don't think it would be any disadvantage. If there's like little infelicities that like that just need to be edited, that's fine. But I mean, if, um, you know, if you're a fluent speaker and you, and you write like a fluent speaker, then, uh, I mean, I think that that's totally fine. Um, if, if it's a case where it's like, um, it might need uh, more work because it's like the the language barrier. Then um, there might be a case where like uh, if if an editor sees the the obvious quality of a thing, um, uh, you know, they could potentially get uh, you know like a, a translator who can speak you know both languages that just do an editorial pass on it or something to polish it up. Like it wouldn't necessarily need a translation, you know, because it's like it's already in English, but maybe something to polish it up. But I don't know. I, I'm just kind of trying to think of all the different ways that that might come up or be addressed but um uh yeah i mean i i, I mean i think in general just it's not it's not a problem because as long as as long as uh, the story is good and um and and the writing is uh you know already in english if, if it's just like a little bit of uh like oh well this is obviously like a a thing that was lost in translation well that's easy enough to fix you know and it's like it's easy to spot those things too um so um and i think yeah. uh, you know as as we're as we're um, interested in, in, you know, lifting up all of these underrepresented groups, we are also interested in in bringing in the rest of the world into this conversation as well. So, like, you know, I know there's uh, there's a lot of uh, writers from all. Uh, there's different countries that have like this, like sort of uh, population of, of people who are attempting to, you know, publish science fiction fantasy stuff in English, uh, even though English is not their language there. Um, and it, it's interesting how some countries it's like prevalent and some countries it's not. Uh, but there's a lot of different uh, people uh, all over the world who are who are doing this. And so, um, yeah, I don't think it's a particular disadvantage. Um, so, yeah, fantastic. And yeah. I think I think the big takeaway from that is if there are just a few issues mm -hmm. with like yeah. a couple of grammar things, yeah, well, yeah. do you know what? There are plenty of native English speakers who have terrible yeah. grammar. Yeah. It's fine. Some of it even slips into traditionally published books sometimes. Right. I've seen <laughs> it happen. It's okay. It's sure. fine. We don't yeah, love yeah. it, but do you know what? It happens. Yeah. Um, so I think in most cases, it wouldn't be an issue. Right. I mean, just to put it all out there, I honestly have to look up lay versus lie every time it comes up. Like, I still, I have never internalized it. Um, mostly, I try to edit it out. <laughs> it's like, okay, can we reword this so that we don't have to figure this out? Because I don't, although I'm also not a copy editor. So I'm like, okay, look, right. only let the copy editor do it, you know. <laughs> Leave it to the specialist. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as a dyslexic, I have to say that I rely heavily on the spell checker. And yeah, yeah, yeah. there are days when not even the spell checker knows what I mean. So <laughs> do you yeah. know what? Right. I'm a native English speaker. Right. But speaking of world building and yes. publishing, let's mm -hmm. take a moment to talk about the Cobalt Guide to World Building. Tell me a little bit about how this wonderful book came to being. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, I had been talking to the people at Cobalt Press about, uh, you know, doing some work for them because, uh, you know, I wanted to get involved in uh, tabletop stuff. And uh, a friend of mine, uh, Jeremiah Tolbert, he's their, he's their webmaster. And so um, so he sort of put in the good word for me and I uh, started talking to them. And so, uh, you know, they thought that this would be a good uh, first project for me since it's like, you know, we could do a we could sort of cross over. Uh, tabletop RPGs and uh, science fiction fantasy because world building, you know, applies to both just as well. And so in the book, it's kind of um, it's kind of half people who are from the publishing world and half people who are from the tabletop world. <laughs> yes, I have so, it too. Yes. Um, oh, is. So uh, yeah, let me read yeah. out that list of names. Sure, so Gail sure. Simone is somebody who writes for um, a big, big yeah. comic book writer, yeah. mega superhero writer. Yeah. Keith Baker, who wrote Eberron, Veronica mm -hmm. Roth, James Sutter, Ken Liu, Ashley Warren, Kate Elliott, Michael E. Shea, you may recognize some of these names, guys, mm -hmm. Tobias S. Buckle, Shanna Germain, Jeff Grubb, uh, Gabe Hicks, and the Dungeon Dudes, mm -hmm. and more. There are so many wonderful names in here. Um, and it takes you through creating pantheons, incorporating technology into your fantasy environments, designing a world. That's what we do, guys. Mm -hmm. Leaving space when world building so that the characters can bring it to life. So much good stuff in here, guys. Cannot cannot recommend it enough. Yeah. I've already 
it's mm. it's uh yeah i've already read it oh nice <laughs> yeah uh Very yeah it was yeah yeah it was a lot of fun to put together uh, i mean it was the first time i'd ever edited a, a, a non-fiction anthology i'd always only done you know short story anthologies um but uh you know world building is something that i've thought a lot about over the years you know because it's like i mean as uh, as an editor of of short stories and novels i mean uh it's like it's a critical component i mean you know a, a science fiction fantasy story like if it doesn't have if the world building doesn't all make sense then it doesn't really work you know um so you know so yeah but it was really interesting to 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 work on and especially to uh to bring both of these worlds and both of these interests that are so near and dear into my heart together into one book um and i hope i hope that uh you know people from publishing also find it and find good use out of it and then you know vice versa um and i think uh it was an interesting tight rope tight tight rope to walk to 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 find essays and topics that uh can mostly apply to both worlds um you know there's some of them that are obviously very explicitly uh focused towards tabletop stuff um but then it's only a very few of them that i think that are are very restricted in that way and almost all of them you know otherwise uh, aside from those few examples uh really can apply to both fiction and tabletop uh rpgs um so yeah i mean but uh, it's uh I, I think I think there's a lot of like important things in here, like uh, like Coral Coral Alejandro Moore's uh, essay, um, "Weave Your World Thread by Thread." Um, Beautiful, yeah, yeah, which is a, a guide to diverse and inclusive world building. Um, I, I think topics like that are really important um, because I think uh, in in RPGs and in fiction, I mean, uh, there's there's still a lot of uh, sort of white uh, default that happens with yeah. characters um and and that's a that's a factor in um in that kind of underrepresentation we were talking about earlier Absolutely, that's that's yeah. part of the reason why uh people are or bipoc people and and you know of of uh every stripe and 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 queer people and and things like that like they don't feel welcome uh writing in these spaces because they don't see themselves re reflected in these in in the stories or in the games and that's not as much of a problem as it used to be it used to be really terrible and like now it's getting a lot better but there's still a lot of work that can be done in that space uh i mean even if you just look at like a uh like just like a dnd module like just a watsi module if you like say you buy it on roll 20 or something like that it's like all the tokens that are in there almost all the tokens like are like look like a white people like i mean yeah. you know the elves look white the people the humans look white you know um there's there's all kinds of uh you know uh monstrous races and stuff that are different colors but all the all the humanoids are basically white uh and you know there's there's a few exceptions you know but but it's very you know noticeable um and uh so i mean that's one of the things that when i dm i i have gone to taking great efforts to make like uh uh you know different npc images that are you know more diverse so that i can you know mix it up because it was like when i was trying to pull things from that was just in the in an adventure or just that was in uh like in the roll 20 search or whatever it's like it was just like too much of it was like okay <laughs> just defaulting to white again here big white um, dudes yeah yeah, yeah. Hot white chicks that's, yeah, yeah 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 that's what dnd art often yeah. looks like yeah yeah, and yeah it's yeah. a shame so yeah. um I've seen, yeah, I've seen a lot more representation and I'm really, really happy to see that. And I think it's, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we've, we've yeah. just got to keep, got to keep moving forward on that. It's about mm -hmm. freaking time. Yeah. We've been humans for quite a long time. It's about yeah. freaking time we came to terms with that. Yeah. Um, so um, I am, yeah, I'm really, really glad to hear that you are, as I say, ringing that mm -hmm. bell and yeah. moving forward with that. Um, that is all we have time for today. So John, thank you so much for coming to join us today. Oh, thanks so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. It was wonderful. And as I say, I will be hitting you up because I think there's a lot of knowledge here I would like to capture and um yeah, turn into blog posts for these beans. They there's you've dropped <laughs> you've dropped a lot for us today. Thank you. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, happy to do it. Alrighty then. In that case, I would like to invite you to grab your hammer and go world build. <laughs> See you soon, beans. Bye.